devoted one verse to husband, so we're going we're gonna to branch out just a little bit. So if you will, turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. That will be where we'll start. But also turn back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. So keep your finger in there. Now we're going to read that and, uh, and another corresponding verse that Paul wrote in Colossians. But I'll start with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Peter says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, to go to Colossians 3.19, you don't need to turn there. It's short. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So let's pray, and then let's consider these passages I just read. Father, we uh, again thank you so much for your word that it so clearly instructs us uh, as to your will for our life is how we should act or conduct ourselves in this world that we are living in is, uh, today and, and on this earth. So Lord, I pray that today as we consider this particular topic of husbands and wives, that you will allow me to speak clearly and, and certainly not misrepresent what you have written here, but to, that we can just uh, understand more about your will for us in marriage and husbands uh, as well. I ask that you open eyes and ears to this truth that is uh, brought forth in your word. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. So you have your uh, hand out there, husbands. That's what this is entitled to today. And I start with marriage because it's the fact that you're married that makes you a husband. Okay, so marriage. Marriage designed by God, right? Uh, Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it, it's not good that man should be alone. Okay? And so he, he created woman, right? He created woman. He gave them dominion over the earth. He gave them he, the command to be fruitful and multiply, right? But then came the fall. Pretty quickly afterwards in our, in our Bibles, we don't know how long that was initially, but then came the fall and everything changed. Everything changed everything. Okay, that's an understatement probably that everything changed. But in the marriage relationship, the one, uh, uh, what really changed is the desire of the woman in Genesis 3.16. He says, now to the to woman, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So it changed the woman's view of the husband. Uh, to man, it made the earth more difficult to give up its fruit. It made weeds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But everything changed. And by the and over the first book of the Bible in Genesis, that relationship between man and woman just got distorted tremendously because sin had entered the world. First there was murder, then there was polygamy, then there's sexual immorality, homosexuality, incest, all in the first book of the Bible. So that distortion, that, that marriage that God created became distorted very quickly once sin entered the world. So the question you have to beg yourself is, How can then two sinful human beings have a marriage that honors God? They have their own sinful desires, their own selfish desires. How can two sinful people come together and have a marriage that honors God? 
And that's really why our divorce is so rampant, certainly, the sin of that. Man, uh, in Malachi, you know, God tells us that he hates divorce. He says, for the man who does not love but divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. He sins against the holy God. Other translations just say uh, more clearly that God hates divorce. In Matthew 19, that's when the Pharisees, when they came up to, uh, you know, they asked that question about divorce, trying to trick Jesus into saying something that they could condemn him with. You know, they asked him, um, uh, you know, why did Moses then command one to give a certificate of divorce for his wife? You know, before that, they said, Can he, in, can't you just get a divorce for your wife for any reason? He said, and then Jesus said, you know, they made their one flesh. You know, God made it this way. And they said, why did Moses command that? And, and Jesus clears it up quite easily in verse 8 there. He says, because of your hardness of heart that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so, right? Because he always said, have you not read? I love that verse he says to the Pharisees when they're trying to trick him because it's in the Bible. God did not make it that way. So then how can they come together? How can they come together, a sinful man and a sinful woman in a marriage that honors God? And how can they navigate sin and temptation in a world that's nothing but sin and temptation? Um, well, number one, I listen on here. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to be regenerate. Ephesians 8, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. You need to have the Spirit living with you. It really starts right there. Because a, a non-regenerate person cannot have a marriage that honors God. You need to be a regenerate person. Number two, then God gives us his word, the Bible. I wrote B-I-B-L-E in capitals because that's an acronym because it's a book of instruction before leaving the earth. It's important that we read that. So we've got the spirit. We have the spirit dwelling within all regenerated, uh, saved human beings that are God's people. And then we have the Bible that instructs us through the working of the Spirit in our mind. And then we have to submit to God. We have to submit to God's Word. And I'll also say we have to submit to our wives because this is to husbands today that we're talking about, right? We must submit to our wives, although it doesn't say that specifically because it says the husband's supposed to be leader of the wife and have authority over the wife, but it's not in a demanding, dictatorial type leadership role. But it's in a way that... <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a loving, caring, protecting, providing relationship and providing for her needs. So in a way, you're, you are submitting to her needs by being the husband that you are called to be. Review. Uh, just last week, wives, remember, told to submit to your husbands, even the unbelieving ones, so as you can win them without even a word uh, to the Lord. <clears throat> um, you're not supposed to uh, adorn yourselves with external jewelry, clothes, things that attract other men, but you're supposed to have that, you know, adorn yourself with the beauty of an inner, quiet, and gentle spirit. And that spirit comes from the Lord, from the regeneration. And you follow the example the holy women did. This is just review from last week. And, and he said, do not fear, women, do not fear any repercussions from being this way. Okay, you know, that can put a... a a believing wife married to an unbelieving spouse, certainly in a precarious position. But do not fear. Trust in the Lord. Stay that way. Now, husbands. Here we go. Husbands. Believing husbands. This is written to believing husbands. It's written to the church uh, that's dispersed, but it's written to believing husbands to give them instructions on living with their wives. And like I said, Peter gave us six verses about wives submitting to husbands, but it's this one about husbands and how they should treat their wives. So that way, but the rest of the Bible kind of fills in the gaps that maybe Peter uh, leaves out. So let's just read verse 7 there again. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, live with your wives, That's, that word synoikio, dwell together, cohabitate, it's a command. You know, you, you, you live together, you don't live separate lives, you don't live separate uh, positionally, play. you know, you, you stay together. That's a command that we do, and you do that also in an understanding way. 
That word understanding is the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. You do it in, a, in, an, in an understanding way. You need to have the knowledge on how to understand your wife, right? Any husband here understand his wife completely? Uh, did someone raise their hand? They did. Okay. All right. Well, okay. I, bless you. You know, that's a praise to God. Um, <laughs> But to live with your wife in an understanding way, what, what Peter's really saying, you have to have the knowledge on how to live with, him, how to live with her um, in the way that honors God, an understanding way. So where does that knowledge come from? We need help with that, so we, ha- we turn to God's word as usual. It only comes through that wisdom of God. It's his word that gives us the instructions and how to live with an understanding way because we don't know that, okay? God will tell us in his word. And he tells us that, that we live with them as, uh, they give honor to them as the weaker vessel. And as we talked about last week, weaker vessel doesn't mean they're weaker intellectually or they're weaker morally or spiritually, but they are physically weaker than a man. That's the way God created them, physically weaker than a man. So we live with them, we honor them as the weaker vessel. We are, uh, we're kind of like we should be their knight in shining armor, we'll put it that way. So Paul then, we'll turn over to Ephesians now, 5. We may not have turned there because I can't read everything on, the, on your handout. Um, just briefly, Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That kind of says the same thing as living with them in an understanding way. But in Ephesians 5, then Paul really gives an extreme charge to husbands. Extreme because it seems impossible to do what he's charging us to do. Husbands, love your wives. Let me stop right there. That word for love. You know, there's many words in the Greek for love. That word's agapeo, the agape love. Uh, There's other words for love called eros, which is the the sensual type love, and phileo, the brotherly type love. But this is agapeo. It's the noble type of love. It's the self-sacrificing type of love. It's the, the, the type that that looks at the object of that love and, and, and says and desires and does what is best for the object of that love. If that makes sense. The words you say, the actions you do demonstrate your love for that. It's an, it's an act of the will. It's a verb, as he's over here. Love is a verb. It's what you do. It's what you say and what you do. It's an act of the will. That type of love is what he's saying. So husbands, love your wives. And then he goes into... As Christ loved the church. Okay. That's a different kind of love than most of us uh, know, human to human. The worldly love, you know, is, is a sinner. And probably what we all, when we fell in love with our wife, you know, we we're attracted to them by physical attractiveness. Hope that was a fulfill, maybe she fulfilled desires that we had. Uh, the way they treated us, her personality, their temperament, there's something about her that drew us to her, okay? But even all those things are fickle, and they're temporary, and they can go away. Um, And when they go away, or when they fade, and they will fade as time goes on, the world says, trade them in. Time for a new one, right? That's a worldly kind of love. You deserve to be happy. Trade them in for a new one. That's what the world tells us. But this is a different kind of love, obviously, how Christ loved the church. So how can we as sinners, though, we're still sinners, even though we're redeemed. How can we as sinners then love in a divine way like Christ loved the church? Okay, that pattern that Christ loved the church is one that, when you think about it, uh, Christ's love for the church began before the foundation of the world, began... There's no worth, uh, it had nothing to do with any worth that we had. It had nothing to do with with God looking down that corridor of time and saying, well, he's going to be worthy, so I'm going to love him as my my people. Uh, It's not that. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with works. Uh, Christ's love for the church is eternal, unconditional. It's divine. So how can we express that? How can we emulate that? in our love for our wives. It seems impossible, okay, but Christ has given us his spirit. He's given us the mind of Christ. He's given us the word to follow after, right? Um, 
that will enable us to love in a manner like that, never perfectly like Christ loved the church, but that is our goal. That, that is our goal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he goes on to in verse... Uh, in the same verse here, he said, and he gave himself up for her. So it's a, the love that Christ showed for the church is that sacrificial love. Um, Christ was mocked, beaten, uh, crucified for us. And when you think about, about it, he knew about it beforehand. You know, it's not just something that kind of happened. You know, he knew beforehand and came down for the purpose of sacrificing himself for us. In Ephesians, it tells us quite plainly, Paul tells us, says, but Christ emptied himself and took the form of a servant, being born into the likeness of men, and then being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So it's a sacrificial love. It's a giving up of oneself for the other. And God's love Certainly, like I mentioned earlier, it's not based on works. It's not based on any worth that we have. It's God's love is really founded in his own nature. We've heard God is love, right? And that is his own nature. And so, again, you have to ask yourself, how can I love my spouse like God? I'm not God. You know, how do I do that? Well, we do have God's nature in us now as redeemed human beings. And again, remember, it starts all with having that spirit within you. You've got to have God's spirit living within you in order to, to do these things. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 5, that God's love has been poured into our hearts. So that love that we're trying to emulate is in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. So we have the spirit within us. We have God's love that he has demonstrated to us. <clears throat> and uh, so that we can, to a certain extent, emulate God's love. And in the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians, he says, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. So, so we have the Spirit of God in us, right? Uh, we're taught by God through his word how to do that. So we have the capacity to love as he loves. And although that won't be perfect, we have to remember also that this love that we are to demonstrate that emulates Christ's love for the church is, is an act of the will and the heart. Okay, so we have the love in there. We have the will that he gives us. We have the spirit that allows us to do that. So ask yourself this question. Well, no, you don't have to ask it. I'll just say it. If every attribute that drew you to your wife goes away, every single one, mind, body, spirit, everything goes away, we're still commanded to love her, right? That's how God loves us. Uh, and maybe even more because... At that point, she would be more in the need of your love. And so this love, God, God's truly love, sees a need and responds to that need. So that's a question you must ask yourself, I think, a lot. Uh, and again, the sacrificial love that, that is demonstrated by Christ was demonstrated in several areas in the Bible. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Uh, the priest and Levite walked by this injured man who needed help. The Samaritan saw the need and at great risk to himself because... He was beaten up because there's robbers everywhere there. He took care of him and did what needed to be done. Christ's washing of the feet of his disciples was even a, a, another example of sacrificial love. Because remember, his disciples, they, they just didn't get it all the time. You know, they were ambitious. They uh, just really didn't understand what he said a lot of the times. And, and when he washed his feet, uh, humbling himself to the most uh, uh, lowly servant, uh, at that time, the lowly uh, thing that a servant would do, he said, this is my example, okay? You do this, I'm sacrificed for you, you do this as, as an example. I'm doing this as an example, you follow my example by what I'm doing. So it's a, it's a, this is another question that you may ask yourself. A Christian husband who is willing to give everything, or a Christian husband who loves only for what he gets from his wife, doesn't love as God loved. That's not an example of godly love. Okay, but a Christian husband who is willing to give everything for his wife, including his life, okay, that husband loves as Christ loved the church. And if you're willing to give your life for your wife, why not be willing to give up other things? You know, you should be willing to give up lesser things in your life, like some of your desires, some of your wants, some of your hobbies, you know, to fulfill the need of your wife. Your wife should look at you 
like Paul describes the way we look at the church and the love of Christ in Romans 8. And I'll just read it to you as well. So this is the way, this is the way we understand Christ's love for us. This should be how your wife sees your love for her as Christ of the church. In Romans 8, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? So nothing's going to separate your husband's love for his wife. Nothing. Okay? No, and all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Christ's love for us. That's how your wife should see your love for her, as Christ loved the church. And then he goes on to say, and this love that Christ demonstrated is a purifying love. It's a sanctifying love. It's a love that... Uh, a love that purifies and makes better the object of the love. So in verses 26 and 27, Paul says that he might sanctify her, speaking of Christ and his church, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So our love, so Christ's love for the church is a sanctifying love. Now certainly at the moment of regeneration, we are cleansed of all sins and we will stand before a holy God on, on our day of death, uh, perfectly righteous, but that's the imputed righteousness from Christ. But while we're here, we still need cleansing. We still sin and fall back. We still need to, to be uh, brought up into Christ's likeness. And so what... Um, what he's saying here, it's just like he says in 1 John, it's, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to continually be sanctified. We need to continually be more uh, made Christ-like, and that's what a husband should be doing for his wife, should be doing that. And the agent of the cleansing is the spirit within you again in the word. I don't, I don't want to harp on that too much, but those are two crucial things and two of the only things that can allow you to uh, love your wife like Christ loved the church. So as Christ desires only what's best for his people, for his church, uh, a husband should be the same way. He should desire only what's best for her. And only what's best for her is to just seek to continually purify her in the world and to continually keep her away from the defilement of the, of the world out there, to protect her, to, you know, to provide for her, and, to, and should never ever induce her to do something that is against God's word. And I think where that applies is probably in dating before you're married. You know, if you're dating someone and, and, and they say they love you, okay? You're not married yet, okay? They say they love you. But they want you to go a step further, like prove your love to me, okay? That's not Christ-like at all. That is worldly love. And that is, uh, that is something that we need to warm our, warn our um, offspring uh, as they encounter those, uh, those encounters as well. So in this, and then verse 28, let's move on. Uh, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Okay, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one's ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So Christ demonstrates, and this is just a simple analogy, Christ demonstrates his care for his body, his church, by caring for it, by nourishing us with the word, by sanctifying us through his spirit. And he's just making the analogy that, that we do the same for our own bodies. You know, we want to take care of our own bodies because our own bodies, keep, we want to keep them strong, give you a sense of well-being. Well, as husbands, we treat our wives as Christ treated his body, okay? And he makes the analogy, you know, that just naturally you take care of your own bodies. Well, you need to take care of your wife even more so as Christ took care of the body. <clears throat> it's just a simple thing. How do you take care of your body? Well, you nourish it, okay? You give it what it needs to grow. You give it what it needs to mature. You give it what it needs to be 
more pure and sanctified in Christ. You need not only physical needs of your spouse, but you need them spiritual needs as well. You need to nourish them with that. And you need to cherish your wife. That word is a really good word. I remember there's a song a long time ago by the associations. The old people remember it, probably most of y'all don't know, but cherish is a word I use to describe you. But we need to cherish our wives. That means we love them. Uh, not only uh, the physical affection, warmth, comfort, you know, we protect them, we provide for them, we want what's best for them. It's just a word that, that, that describes that feeling that we should have for that. So as members of Christ's body, we're one with him, right? We're one in spirit. Uh, Paul tells us in Corinthians, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, right? So we're one with Christ. So as a husband and wife, we are also one. Remember, the two became one flesh. So therefore, we care for our wives as we care for ourselves, following that example of Christ caring for his body as well. That's what Paul is teaching us there. In verse 31, then, he says, Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, this is a direct quote from uh, Genesis 2.24 again. That, um, but let's look at that just a little closer. Leave father and mother. That's the first command there. Okay. Uh, a lot of times, well, upon marriage now, you have created a new family, right? A new head of that family as well. Okay. A lot of times in, in early marriages, failure to leave, failure to... Um, now, we should always honor our folks and take care of them. That's not what I'm saying. But, but a lot of times that can become a contention between newlyweds, that they want to do what their parents tell them what to do, and this one's to their parents, and their parents are probably different. And y'all experience that? <laughs> anyway, that, it, it's a command. You know, now that you are married, it's a whole new family unit, whole new authority. You don't disregard your parents, but you make your own decisions. And sometimes that's hard to do in a newly, newly married thing. And so... So, so the husband, you're placing that role of leadership then at, once you are married for this new family that's formed, not the old one. So you must leave mother and father and then hold fast. The word is sometimes translated cleave, proskaleo, okay? And it literally means to be glued together, glued or cemented together. Now, what does that tell you? You're one, right? I mean, it, it, it's permanent. It's like super glue. It's permanent. It... it, it uh, connotates unity, okay, and is indivisible, should not be split. Um, you know, Jesus told again the Pharisees in that Matthew 19 exchange he had with them about divorce. He says, so then you're no longer two, but you're one flesh. Therefore, what man has joined, to, I mean, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Because God hates divorce, Right? And God will always hate divorce. And although he tolerated it in certain instances and he has provided uh, a couple of those instances uh, in his word um, and he will forgive divorce, he still hates it. He still hates it as, as with any sin. But as with any sin, he can forgive it as well also. So as a, as a believing husband, then, and, and indwelt by the Spirit, okay, commanded by the word to love your wife as Christ loved the church, if and when your wife sins against you, what do you do? What do you do? We well, have to ask a question. I'm going to answer a question with a question. What did Christ do for you when you sinned against him? That's the example we're following there. And are your wife sin any greater than the sins you've committed against Christ? No. And he didn't divorce us, did he? Okay. But even that sin of adultery, one of the provisions that Christ ma made uh, for divorce, I guess we'll say, even that sin of adultery, it does not necessitate divorce. It's not a command to divorce, right? That's, that's the whole theme of the book of Hosea. Okay, God commanded Hosea to take a wife of adultery, a wife that, that was even a prostitute, and commanded him to take her back and forgive her. Um, God took Israel back after... Israel committed spiritual adultery with all the other gods over the time as well, too. But that's the idea. That it's, it's a forgiveness in sin. It's forgiveness of your wife, whatever she may do to you. 
I bet you say your husbands are probably sin more against your wife than she has against you, but because that's just our nature. Um, but we are to be forgiving as God has forgiven us. And then he goes on to say that this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. So what's he talking about here? Well, we know what a mystery is. It's something that um, was unknown, but now it's been revealed. Okay, so I think he's talking about, he's kind of making this uh, comparison here to marriage and, and Christ. Okay, the mystery of Christ and his church was a mystery in the Old Testament, right? We knew they prophesied Messiah was going to come, but did they know who, when? Did they know what it was going to look like? No, it, it was a mystery, and it was not revealed until Christ came and, that, uh, and showed that the kingdom was something that you entered by faith and not by works. Uh, so that's a mystery one, but I think it really points more also to the sacredness of marriage. It's comparing Christ in the church and Christ's love for the church and on the husband and his love for his wife, that it should emulate that. So it, it gives marriage that, um, that sacredness that, that God always meant for it to be, right? That God always said it was when he created um, woman for man. And that kind of brings us in full circle back to First um, Peter again, uh, kind of finish up there again. Uh, I'll just read again. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they, were, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So God's word contains this knowledge we needed to live with our wives in an understanding way. We need to understand how we are. We need to understand the gift they are to you, uh, and how we are to treat them, how we are to love them, how we are to protect them and provide for them. And we may not understand our wives um, completely, like I said earlier, uh, but we do know by God's word how we are to love her and how we are to treat her. And it's not by taking charge, man, and lording it over them. Okay, It's not by uh, being a demanding Husband, that uh, you do this or else, not by that at all. It's like Christ loved his church. It's that perfect example that he gives for us, that sacrificing example he gives for us. We, um, we sacrifice for our wives. So to show our love for our wives, it's self-sacrificing. It's going to sanctify her. It's going to purify her. It's going to make her more and more like Christ. That's our love for her. At the same time, we honor her as a weaker vessel, so we protect her, we provide for her, we nourish her, we cherish her. Um, those are the types of love that we are to give our wife because that is the example that is given to us in Christ's love for the church. So we show this honor as a weaker vessel. That's just saying that that's a continual attitude that we have. I mean, again, she should... She should look at you like that knight in shining armor. That's what you should be always taking care of her as a weaker vessel. And then he said in there, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. So what exactly is he pointing to there? Well, commentators are different on this, but I think it's pointing to both this life and the next. Okay, your, your wife is a, a grace that God has given you. Okay, it's only by the grace of God that you have that wife. And so she is one grace that God has given you in this life, right? And so it's in this life, husbands, you must treat them like we were talking earlier this morning as your best friend, your companion, right? Um, your help meet. It's a grace that God has given you as a husband. So we treat her like that. And, it, and if your wife is a believer as well, then, it, you know, this is pointing also that she's going to inherit the eternal life with you as well. But she's only your wife while she's here on earth. You know that, right? Okay. She will always be your sister in Christ, but she's only your wife while here. And so we treat her as Christ treated the church. And so he ends up saying, so your prayers may not be hindered. Oh, okay. Well, so the prayers... 
you know, we want God to hear our prayers. We want God to answer our prayers. It goes, there's, been a, there's a lot of things that, keep, that hinder our prayers. And we just had a, a nice study on the sovereignty of God in prayer. And there's a lot of things that can hinder your, your prayers to God. And just, just mentioned a few of them here that we can mention in closing. Um, certainly continued unconfessed sin, disobedience. I think disobedience on my list there should have been up on number one. Um, Psalm 66, 18 the psalmist says this, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, okay, the Lord would not have listened. Cherish iniquity. That means you love your sin, right? So you love your sin. If I kept that in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear your prayers, okay? Lack of faith, certainly James tells us, you know, that you must have that faith in God that he's going to hear your prayer and understand uh, and act on it. But if you doubt, he says... In James 1, 6 through 8, but let him ask in faith, no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Ask in faith, your prayers of faith. Certainly we ask with wrong motives. Um, again, James tells us, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So as a husband praying for things for your wife that are not in her best interest, not things that glorify God, uh, are prayers that will not be heard and not answered by God. And certainly, uh, number four, their unforgiveness. You know, that, that's one of those things that we all maybe struggle with. Because even after the Lord gave the Lord's prayer to his disciples, he ended, he, at the very end of that, he said this. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So if you do that, God's going to forgive you. He's going to hear your prayers. He's going to forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. All right, so we can't ask God to forgive us when we sin. We can't come to God if we don't have a forgiving heart in us and we are forgiving others. You know, it's that, it's that parable of the unforgiving servant. You know, you have been forgiven much, and if you cannot forgive people, your prayers will be hindered. God will not hear those prayers. He won't forgive you and hear that. So we must be a forgiving people, as we know. And then number five, they're not acknowledging God's sovereignty. You know, our prayers need to begin with God's sovereignty, uh, acknowledging that he is over all of it, and end with not my will, but thy will be done. That's the only way God will hear your prayer. So those are things that kind of limit that. So, <clears throat> so, just, so just to husbands, again, if we're not loving our wives as Christ loved the church, okay, to the best of our abilities, you know, our prayers will be hindered because we are being disobedient to God and not loving our wives that way. Our prayers will be hindered. So just in kind of conclusion here, uh, Peter and Paul are giving their husband, they're giving us as husbands a command, a charge, uh, that we should treat our, lives in, our wives in an understanding way, and that, that way is the way Christ cared for his church and his people. And because of that indwelling spirit, we have the capacity to do that. Not perfectly, but we can do that to emulate Christ and his love for the church. Um, but our love for our wives should picture Christ's love for the church. People should see us loving our wives and see that picture that Christ loved this church. And that sends a message to certainly everyone that we're around. Unbelievers, our family, everybody can see that. And, and know why it is like that, because we uh, act as Christ loved the church. We're, we, we love them in a sacrificial way, a sanctifying way. We want what's best for them to make them more and more like Christ. But at the same time, we're they're the protector. We're the provider. Um, we nourish, we cherish, we love, we, we honor them as our wives because they're one of God's graces he's given us, right? I mean, I don't know what I'd do without my wife. <laughs> Christ commands it, and failure to do so will hinder your prayers, okay? I read somewhere that a man was worried that he loved his wife too much, okay? When asked by an elderly, wise man, would he love her as much as Christ loved the church? And he said, no. 
He said, well, then you need to love her more. Right? That's how we should love our wives, as Christ loved the church. Let's pray and have some time of fellowship. Father, thank you again for your word, your word that teaches us, uh, the word that gives us instruction, the word that, that we can only understand by your spirit living in us, and we can only submit to it by that spirit as well. But Lord, we just thank you for this time. I pray that this has been edifying to, to uh, the husbands that have been here, as well as the wives, to hear this. Um, and I pray that as we go forth from here, that we will strive to do that, to love our wives more and more as you love us. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.